Good morning, uh, and welcome back to my lecture series, my 113, ASTR 113 uh, series, Stars, Galaxies, and the Universe. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, the interstellar medium and star formation uh, in some depth. Still very much at an introductory level, but a little bit more depth than I did with my AS, uh, ASTR 103 lectures. All right, let's see if Rob can tech today. Yay! So we're going to be answering the question, how do stars form? Ultimately, we're going to be answer, uh, asking the question, uh, in order to answer that question, we have to understand the environment in which stars form. Uh, where do they form? How do those, how did those places, uh, very specific places in the galaxy, uh, how did they get to be where they are? How do they get to consist of what they do? Uh, the sizes of uh, sizes, masses, that sort of thing. So, which brings us to the, another question, a more fundamental question, or as it were. Is there material between stars? Stars obviously have to be made up of something, and as I discussed last uh, in the last lecture, stars are primarily composed of hydrogen and helium, because that is, and then a little bit of metals, because hydrogen and helium were the primary constituents that were born from the Big Bang, and then through a process of uh, stellar evolution, heavier elements came into being, and uh, and then went into future generations of, of stars. So is there material between these stars? If it is, if there is, if that answer to that question is yes, what's it composed of? Are there a variety of different types or uh, environments uh, that this material lives in? How, uh, how do stars form from that material? And how do planets form from that material? And then um, we, the next questions would be how do stars, um, protostars, very young emerging stars, how do they evolve into normal stars and so forth. And then ultimately, as I mentioned in the, again in the last lecture, the primary, the vastly dominant characteristic that controls all of this is mass. So the stuff between stars, we refer to as the interstellar medium, or the medium between stars. Interstellar, anyway. Interstellar medium, not, has nothing to do with the movie. So what constitutes the interstellar medium? Well, let me define that a little bit more uh, closely, I guess. Interstellar medium is the material that is outside of stellar systems or solar systems like the one we have now um, and contained within a galaxy. So the medium inside a solar system is different than the medium between stars which is in itself different from uh, the medium between galaxies. So we're going to be focusing in on the medium between stars. And that medium is primarily composed of dust and gas. Most of that gas, or most of that medium is, uh, is gas, is in hydrogen and helium form, again with a tiny bit of metals. The dust, which are, uh, you know, essentially is rocky material, you can think of it as dust, a, geolo a geologist would balk at that description, but very small particulates of solid matter, and that can suppose about 1% of the stellar dust and that one percent of stellar dust is important on multiple levels uh, for one thing without that dust um, we wouldn't be here one the rocky material that we're composed of started out as dust and two there is an argument to me uh, that has been made that the organic material that forms the basis of life those uh, those complicated structures formed on the surfaces of interstellar dust. So if we did not have dust, then complicated biological or complicated organic molecules could not have formed uh, in the universe. This gas is very tenuous. Uh, it's about the density of which is about one atom per cubic centimeter uh, 
around the solar nebula or solar neighborhood. Again, as we'll find out, the, inter the density of the interstellar medium is not constant. It is not homogeneous throughout the, uh, throughout the galaxy. Uh, there are, depending on the temperature involved of the galaxy, depending on the temperatures of the galaxy in certain parts of the galaxy, that density is going to go up or it's going to, um, it's going to go down drastically or it's going to go up fairly significantly. The interstellar medium is also responsible for uh, creating its own energy. Uh, the, the gas and the dust is, is not inert. It absorbs the energy around it from stars and then re-radiates that in other directions which we can see. Now one of the ways that interstellar dust is, is a factor and for myself, this is the this is how it how I sort of deal with it. I think of dust as as an as a nuisance because I am interested in stars. I'm interested in looking at uh, stars and looking actually in these star forming regions where this dust happens to be. And unfortunately, it does two things: it um, causes extinction, meaning that it causes the objects embedded within this dust or on the opposite side of the dust to be, uh, to be dimmer than if that dust were not present. One of the reasons why we cannot see to the other side of the galaxy, at least visually, like you can see in the upper, uh, upper, di or upper picture, is because of massive dust clouds that lie between us and the, the opposite side. You can see those, as those dark regions in the, um, within the plane of the galaxy. Now we do have alternatives that sort of punch through that dust. If you look in the infrared or the radio, uh, those wavelengths do pass by the dust without being affected by it overly much. And so we can see deeper into the, uh, into the galaxy. We can see potentially the opposite side of it. But for visual observ observations, it's kind of a pain. The other thing that it does is that it causes, not only does it cause objects to be redder, it causes objects to be, or excuse me, not only does it cause objects to be dimmer, it causes those objects to appear redder than they actually are. Now, the way to think about this is when you have a, a boat in, a boat of a certain size in the ocean, and there are waves that propagate through this ocean and cause the, 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 the boat to bob, if the, the wavelength of those waves is long in comparison to the size of the boat, then the boat is basically going to gradually raise and come down. Things are not violent. Things are, you know, fairly peaceful. You might get sick, but outside of that, you're, you're in good shape. If the wavelength gets shorter, particularly in or it gets shorter with respect to the size of the boat, that's when things can get dangerous. The boat, uh, the boat is rapidly moving up and down, um, and it can also, you know, depending on the amplitude of the wave, it can go up and, you know, basically capsize, like that movie. Uh, I think it's, is it, is it uh, Chris Pine, Perfect Storm? Anyway, things get bad. In sort of a related or analogous way, what we find is that if we take the light coming off of going through space, and it's passing by a, a molecule, or excuse me, it's passing by a dust grain. Now these dust grains can be uh, typically on a, the order of a micron, or one millionth of a meter. If the wavelength is comparable to that, or if the wavelength is longer than that, say infrared and uh, radio waves, then that light just basically passes by that, uh, that molecule, or excuse me, that dust particle, and really does get affected by it. It just kind of, it sort of doesn't notice. The, the particle or the dust really isn't perturbed by the light passing by it. But if the wavelength is of comparable size to the dust grain or smaller, then that dust grain will be bothered or be perturbed by that, um, by that wave. It can, do, um, it can do one of two things with it. It can either scatter that light into a direction that we that doesn't come to us and so therefore we can't see it or it will absorb that light and then re-emit it in longer wavelengths as heat and so in that way 
And that is basically what causes the reddening. So not only do you have um, not only do you have shorter wavelengths being blocked out or redirected by um, by the light, only allowing longer wavelengths, IR and radio, to pass by it without being overly affected, you also have an additional source of infrared radiation from the heat of the part of the dust itself. Now, when we look at the stars, we can see this reddening in an extinction in, in two ways, we, um, as a function of its spectrum. Now, now, stars have, again, what we call an absorption spectrum. You have a black body curve, which illustrates the intensity or amount of luminosity that the star puts out over a uh, course of a wavelength. And uh, if we're talking about a perfect black body, then that curve is, is continuous. Basically, just it rises, peaks, and then comes back down again in a slope year, <laughs> shallower slope sort of way. On top of that, you have uh, these absorption bands, or these absorption dips, which is where light hits those uh, molecules, or hits those um, atoms, and that light gets absorbed because that light is of a specific energy that the, uh, say, hydrogen atom, for example, the electron is responsive to it and then absorbs that energy and then will re-emit that energy in a random, again, in a random sort of way. And so what we see when we take the spectrum of a star is this uh, roughly continuous black bodies curve superimposed with these absorption lines, essentially luminosity, which is, uh, which is leached out of the, uh, the light up from the star, which tells us about the composition of the outer layer of that star. Anyway. So if we look at this particular star, this particular star is uh, probably uh, F0, around early um, G-type star, like a G1, or a late F star, like an F, F8, F, or F8, F7, something like that. It's very solar. It, it looks very much like our sun. But if you put dust in the way, and you take the spectrum of that same star, what we find is that you lose almost all of the light in the blue. Um, and it's really kind of just a steep function, or a channel. It's a function, an increasing function towards the red. And the whole thing is dimmer. The whole amount of, um, the amount of energy, or the amount of lumina, or the apparent brightness, is comparable to the area under this curve. So, the area under, under here, if you take the basically calculate what the area under this curve is, that would tell you essentially its apparent brightness uh, because of related to its distance. But if you look over here, this area is smaller, and so the overall effect is since there is, the area is smaller, there is less light being detected by the observer, and because it is peaking the red, the star appears redder. Now this is confusing. Oh, and the position of the absorption lines is not affected, which is good, because what's confusing about this, or what's potentially confusing, is that it can take a star that, from just the intensity of things, the intensity of that peak wavelength, can look like an F star, a late F, uh, F star, early G star, and it can make it look like a K or M star. And so you can make fundamental, you can be, you can get the star wrong. You can think the mass is much lower than it actually is. You can think the radius is much smaller than it actually is. Um, the only, or one of the ways to distinguish a, a sun-like star that is being extincted and an M-type star that isn't, is the absorption lines. Certain absorption, as we saw in the last lecture, certain absorption lines are more prominent in, say, G-type stars and not prominent in M-type stars. Here is just a diagram essentially uh, talking about what I, or detailing what I've been talking about. You have white light, or light, from all wavelengths going past the, the dust grain. The higher wavelengths, the blue light, the ultra, uh, ultraviolet light, that is all um, redirected or absorbed by the, the, the dust grain, allowing longer wavelengths to pass by it. And then on top of that, the absorbed energy that the dust grain has gets re-emitted uh, 
everywhere, but also in the direction of the uh, towards the observer as red light. Dust grains are typically on the or, or typically cool, um, and by cool I mean ten very cold to around three hundred Kelvin, which really would be the which is a little bit hotter than the surface of the Earth. In terms of a star, it's cold. So, when we look at um, when we look at the interstellar medium, what we find is that there are that the the gas and dust is not homogeneous, as I hopefully mentioned before, but it is clustered in certain regions, and we call these um, these clusters interstellar clouds, and we can see that in the far infrared on the top. This is what the galaxy looks like in the far infrared, and we see that most of the of the interstellar material is locked within the disk of the galaxy. But there is some higher, um, there is some tenuous clouds above and below the disk, uh, where there is dust and gas concentrated to a certain uh, certain region. If we look in the closer IR or nearer IR exactly, we can see where star, and this is really traces where stars form, you can see almost all of that dust and gas is constrained to the disk of the galaxy. Now, inner cloud, when we talk about interstellar or intercloud gas, what we're talking about is gas and dust which is concentrated within an interstellar cloud. We, this has become more important when we talk about molecular clouds, molecular complexes. When we look at the interstellar medium, we can subdivide or subcategorize the interstellar medium into four different components based on their temperature, and uh, based on their temperature, the temperature then affects the density, which then also affects, well, affects the density and it affects the, the state of hydrogen, essentially what the atoms look like, what state you will find the atoms in within that cloud. Going from hottest to coolest, we have the hot inner cloud gas. Basically, you have these uh, inner uh, these clouds of interstellar dust and gas. The for hot inner cl uh, cloud gas, you the temperature is on the order of about a million degrees Kelvin. It's very very uh, rarefied, and the hydrogen gas, really any gas that is uh, any element that's within this gas, is going to be ionized. It's going to be individual, um, individual molecules, or excuse me, individual atoms, and they're going to be stripped of their electrons, particularly hydrogen. Now, in, as the cloud cools, you're going to have warm inner cloud gas, which is around 8,000, a few thousand Kelvin. The density gets a little bit higher because uh, the gravity is more able to pull things together. It doesn't have to fight the kinetic energy produced by that heat, that energy of motion. It doesn't have to fight as hard to wrangle all of those uh, molecules, or atoms, I should say, into a certain location. In here, with this, inner, um, the, this cloud of gas, you have hydrogen in sort of a mixed state. Some of it will be ionized. Some of the energy that's in the cloud is high enough to strip away the electron. In other instances, the, uh, the hydrogen atom will still hold on to its electrons and be f basically neutral. Um, then as the cloud cools off even more, you have cold inner cloud gas. This uh, temperatures are again on the order of around 100 Kelvin, or about the temperature of, well, a little bit less than the temperature of this, uh, the surface of the Earth. Uh, density increases because again gravity doesn't have to work as hard to pull everything in. Uh, all of the uh, hydrogen in this case is, is neutral, basic, meaning that it, all of the hydrogen or a large constituent or large percentage of the hydrogen still has their electrons bound to the protons. And then you have interstellar clouds, uh, or more specifically what I like to call molecular clouds. Uh, the temperature now is around 10 tens of Kelvin. Uh, it is the densest you're going, the densest of any other part of the interstellar medium. Uh, the hydrogen not only is neutral, but it can also form into molecules. The temperature is so low that the um, that the hydrogen atoms can bond chemically and then not be torn apart by 
photon, high, higher energy or high enough energy photons that are swimming around this, this cloud. It's not completely molecular. There are certain atoms hanging around, but there's a sufficient amount, amount of uh, molecular, there's sufficient amount of hydrogen molecular form uh, that, hence we call it a, uh, a molecular cloud. Now, where do you find hot inner cloud, uh, hot inner cloud gas? Sounds a little dirty. These are regions primarily uh, heated by, or not exclusively, heated by supernovae. So we're going to learn later on that higher mass stars die violently. They explode. They are the second most energetic thing in the universe. That's the second most uh, energetic phenomenon in the universe. They are tremendously violent. And that explosion causes the gas to, or imparts to the gas, a tremendous amount of energy, and thus that energy gets uh, essentially is translated into the energy of motion, which is def which defines temperature in this case. And so you, these particles are these atoms are moving around very very quickly, and the temperature is millions of Kelvin. Now, if you were to have a spaceship in this hot uh, interstellar uh, intercloud gas, it's not going to instantly melt because the as shown before, it's very, very rarefied. You're going to have uh, essentially one atom per, or 0 0.005 atoms per cubic centimeter. Or another way of looking at it is, let's see if I can do the math right, is essentially five atoms per cubic meter. Uh, yeah, on that order. So, you're going to, the, the spacecraft is going to be hit occasionally by these very very high energy um, these very high energy particles which might cause uh, some damage to the electronics but the spacecraft is certainly not going to melt probably isn't a very great place to be but it's not as hot as you would might expect it to be from sort of an everyday sort of life um, the sun itself resides in a local bubble of, of million degree gas. The, uh, the current understanding is that the sun was created from a supernova event. Um, and I'll get into what that is, uh, why that is. Hopefully I'll get it, remember to get into that when we talk about stellar formation in molecular clouds. A, in essence, a supernova blew up and forced gas that was close to it to cluster together get denser and then from that the sun formed from that material from that material warm interstellar medium uh, it really is is found around stars particularly hot stars they form into what we refer to as h2 regions um, when you form a hot star like an o or b type star you're going to have very prominent winds coming off of it you're going to have very high energy photons coming off of it and uh, rapid molecular rapid atoms flying through space and this is going to cause any surrounding hydrogen to a certain radius to be stripped of their electrons and it's going to impart a great deal of energy and thus motion to these things and so you're going to have this sort of bubble around it where it's only protons only h2 um, basically what that means is ionized pro ionized hydrogen a soup of of protons and electrons surrounding these, th uh, these things. Neutral hydrogen re uh, regions are regions, where, as, a, it, as the name would imply, where neutral hydrogen exists. It is hot enough that the major that the, the if, they, if two hydrogen atoms get close enough, close enough for a chemical bond to form, a photon, high, a photon with a sufficient amount of energy comes by and breaks it apart. It's like a fifth grader dance with chaperones. It does emit amount of it does emit a certain amount of energy, and this is primarily seen in the radio. Now there is a quantum mechanical effect, which I really won't get too much into, uh, called a spin flip. Now, subatomic particles, protons and electrons, have what is known as a spin, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise or you can think of it as 
um, they have a north or south polarity. This is not a magnetic thing. This is more of just a directional thing. And so in the, in the ground state, or the low energy lazy state, then the proton is going to spin one way and the electron is going to spin the in the opposite way. So maybe counterclockwise for the proton when looked from above and uh, clockwise for the um, uh, clockwise for the electron. If a radio wave, radio photon smacks at very low energy um, photon, specifically one of uh, say 21 centimeters smacks into this thing it's going to cause that uh, that orientation that electron orientation to flip and then get uh, get become aligned with the protons spin both counterclockwise for example but that is a high state nature isn't lazy it's not going to like being in that state for very long and it will caught and the electron will flip back down again releasing that energy and this light permeates the the milky way of and then we can observe it here on Earth, and we see it as uh, we see it in spectra or uh, radios tuned specifically to the frequency of 21 centimeter lines. And we can see the essentially the neutral hydrogen gas, which is uh, which is emitting this. It is an excellent way to map out the overall hydrogen distribution of the of the galaxy what that ordinary what that can trace or what we can use from that is or what information we can glean from that is the basic structure basic morphology of the of the the galaxy we can see from our observations of neutral hydrogen that most of the hydrogen gas is trapped in what it looks like a disk like structure and that you have filamentary uh, hydrogen uh, above and below with other observations, we can also see that the center of the, uh, what we refer to as the center of the galaxy, actually contains more gas than the wings of the galaxy. Um, and then finally, we get to molecular clouds. Molecular clouds are molecular hydrogen, but they are, they, the density is high enough, and so the the dust concentration was also high enough. So before we made this, I made the statement that the, the amount of dust within the interstellar medium is about 1%. Um, and that is on average. But in molecular clouds, that clouds, not clouds, clouds, that percentage goes up to about 10%. And that causes a significant amount of interstellar uh, reddening. And the, the best way to look at it is this dark nebula. Um, this is referred to as a dark nebula, um, where we have, if you look at this region of space in V, it would look like a void. Or there would be no stars in it whatsoever. That's not actually the case. In the actual fact, there are probably a higher density of stars here than there are anywhere else in the, in the surrounding regions. And we can only see just even a, a smaller amount of them in the infrared. When we look in the infrared, we can see uh, some of the brighter infrared sources. Because again, even though we're looking in the infrared, there is still a certain amount of uh, extinction and a certain amount of reddening that is, uh, that is happening. As before, these, uh, these clouds have temperatures of around 10 Kelvin, which leads to densities as high as 10 to the 10th molecules per cubic centimeter. Referring to sort of give you a sense of scale, the hot interstellar medium had a density of 0 0.005 molecules per cubic centimeter. So this is orders of magnitude more dense than those hot bubbles of, of gas uh, created by supernovae. And it's cold enough also that not only does molecular hydrogen exist, but molecular helium and other molecules also exist, like um, molecular nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth. And as I said, more complex molecules can survive on dust grains that will lead to these carbon, um, carbon structures, organic uh, structures. These clouds, these clouds are known, as I keep saying, are known as molecular clouds, but they can form, they can be as large as um, 
has 100 or 200 uh, light years uh, or parsecs across. So immense structures. These are some of the largest coherent structures in, or well, really, they are the largest coherence individual structures within the galaxy. Uh, they are far larger than globular clusters and even larger than, than open clusters. And they overall, they contain about 10 million times as much uh, mass as the sun does. And so there is a tremendous amount of, well, there is, a, you know, there's plenty of material from which other stars and new stars can form. So how do uh, stars form? How does uh, star formation occur? Well, the first thing that I really want to stress is that everything in the universe, everything, possibly even the universe itself, although that may not actually make any sense, but everything within the universe rotates. It has a spin of one form or another. Nothing in the universe, as far as I am aware, actually sits still relative to everything else around it. So, how does this? Uh, so, what does this have to do with the price of tea in China? First, we have to understand uh, that these stars, these molecular clouds, when they form, when the the temperature gets cold enough that hydrogen can exist as a molecule, other elements can exist as molecules. Um, they don't again do so in a homogeneous manner. Some of the cloud parts of the clouds are denser than other parts of the cloud. It is also not in what we refer to as hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, it is not in a state where the pressure due to gravity is being perfectly balanced by uh, the pressure from something else, be it magnetic pressure or thermal pressure or radiation pressure. Gravity is winning. And as it wins, it's going to win around, uh, overall, it's going to win and it's going to bring everything closer towards the center of, uh, center of mass. But in so doing, because the cloud itself is not homogeneous, there are going to be pockets of material that collapse even faster than the overall cloud itself. And we refer to these as molecular cloud cores, and it's from these cores that stars actually form. Now, as the, uh, as the um, cloud collapses, we start, we start having significant pressures from magnetic fields, uh, thermal radiation, and angular momentum uh, conservation, which is going to affect how quickly this cloud uh, collapses in upon itself and what shape it takes as it collapses down. So if we look at one of these uh, cloud cores, it collapses under its own weight. Now, remember, everything in the universe is rotating. So the overall molecular cloud is rotating. As it collapses down into molecular cords, cores, those are rotating. And we know from uh, conservation of, of angular momentum that as something rotate, uh, the as something gets smaller, the distribution of mass gets smaller. The rotation spins up. The classic example is the figure skater. Figure skater will, will begin a spin and their arms are going to be out. As they bring their arms in, they're going to spin up very, in some cases, very, very rapidly. The same thing happens here. So, as this is, as this is happening, again, because gravity is a function of distance, inverse function of distance squared, the inner parts of the, of the collapsing core are going to gravitate and form and become denser more rapidly than the rest of the cloud itself. And what that produces is a protostar in the very center of this core will begin to form. Um, it, the density of the material and the density of the gas is much smaller and the energy of collapse becomes very high and it creates a tremendous amount of thermal energy enough to significantly slow down the uh, the force of gravity or rather excuse me the pressure of gravity crushing everything in 
The material surrounding it, on the other hand, will, um, instead of collapsing down into something that is spherical in nature, uh, the cloud is going, to, is going to spread out and form a disk, or a protostellar disk, or a circumstellar disk, or uh, an accretion disk, depending on what kind of science you're looking at, we actually have three names for this freaking disk. It's going to collapse down. And the reason why it collapses down into a disk is because of the spin. The spin is the centrifugal force is pushing out as the thing, the velocity increases, as the spin velocity increases. Centrifugal force is going to push this thing out um, on around the sides, um, basically perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And then there is no essential, uh, there is a significant centrifugal force in the direction of the poles. And so it goes this way rather than spinning down as a sphere. So. We have this thing called gravitational potential energy. Now, we refer to this as, this is energy, potential energy. This is energy that has the potential to change into something else. Now you can have chemical potential, you can have chemical potential energy, you can have, uh, I guess, spring potential energy or uh, potential energy from a compressed spring. But in this case, we have gravitational potential energy. The best way to think about that is hold up something from a desk. You have given this, uh, you have given this, in this case, a thumb drive, you've given this, I've given this thumb drive a higher amount of gravitational potential than this desk. What that means is if I just drop it, right now I have force competing against the pressure of gravity uh, and I'm keeping it stable above the thing. So I, the potential energy is basically constant. It's staying there. But as soon as I let it go, that potential energy changes. That potential energy in this case changes to thermal energy or as i mentioned before thermal energy is well the the energy of heat and also the energy of motion the hot, the greater amount of thermal energy the faster the particles within that region are moving around and because the the particles are moving faster and faster with greater thermal energy as this gravitational potential gets uh, further uh, further converted or converted more into thermal energy, then you can have the core eventually starting to do nuclear fusion or fusing deuterium. We're going to get into more of the specifics of nuclear reactions later on when we talk about um, specific stars, like uh, specific stars and how they evolve. But ultimately, two elements. There is a force, which is electrostatic force, and uh, that is basically causing them to want to repel from each other. Trying to get them together is rather difficult. The uh, Coulomb force basically is, is going to push against bringing them together. But if the particles are moving fast enough, they have enough energy to ultimately get close enough that another fundamental force, a strong force, latches onto them and causes them to fuse together. And so in this case, we have thermal energy which is high enough to cause hydrogen atoms to fuse into an isotope of uh, hydrogen called deuterium. When we look in these, when we look in these protostellar um, regions, or we look, I'm sorry, when we look into these molecular clouds and specifically molecular cloud cores, we see um, from infrared studies, basically the studies of infrared light, um, we and the spectra thereof, we can see that there is molecular structures that reveal these these protostars in their disk. Uh, Hubble did a a um, up until very recently, up until the the advent of uh, optical inter or infrared uh, infrared interferometry. Uh, we, the only way that we've seen these disks is actually Hubble imaging them. And those are the, we can see them when they're edge on. We can see this dark uh, region, again, because of interstellar extinction. 
which is blocking out the light of the protostar, and we can see this flaring disk come across it. The protostar gets to a point where it is in what we refer to as hydrostatic equilibrium. The pressure from gravity is balanced perfectly from the thermal pressure pushing outward. So the gravitational potential energy is converted into thermal energy until the thermal energy converted by that potential is sufficient enough to actually stop the, the, that conversion. Uh, the pressure due to gravity uh, is, uh, is then equalized. The amount of thermal energy, the thermal pressure pushing outward, uh, gets to a point where it equates to the pressure of gravity pushing inward. And so the, the protostar is, roughly speaking, in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. It will compress slightly as it evolves, but not nearly as quickly as, um, as, it was, uh, as the core was doing prior to that. And, and this is a, a relationship that we will see uh, more and more. And uh, astronomically speaking, it pretty much holds. If you take a, uh, a quantity of gas and you compress it, then two things are going to happen. The temperature of that gas is going to go up, and the density of that gas is going to increase. So as the volume gets down, uh, gets smaller, as the pressure, the inward pressure gets larger, the temperature goes up and the density goes up. Now, if the outward pressure gets larger, and the volume gets larger, then the temperature is going to drop, and the and the um, and the density is also going to drop. How does how does a protostar then become a star? Eventually, and again, because of the fact that gravity is an in, uh, the pressure of gravity is an inverse square of distance. Even the protostar is still collapsing. Gravity is still a thing. It's still pulling things to, you know, towards the center. And it's doing so more rapidly in the core than it is in the outer envelope of the star. So there's a density sort of gradient as it uh, uh, going through this thing. The inner parts of the core get more and more den or, uh, denser than the outer parts of the core. Everything is getting denser, but the inner part of the core is getting more dense than uh, than the or is getting denser quicker than the density of the envelope and as such again as the volume of the of the inner parts of this claw of the star get lar or get smaller the pressure goes up the density goes up and more importantly the temperature goes up when the core hits a temperature of roughly around 10 million Kelvin that is sufficient that the thermal energy of these hydrogen atoms actually slam into each other and fuse into helium. And at this point, we have, once that helium begins to burn, the star m moves from being a protostar into being a main, or, yeah, protostar into being a main sequence star. This is where it technically becomes a star. And as I said before, it is of the definition of a main sequence star is that in the core hydrogen is burning into helium and at this point the star really is in hydrostatic equilibrium here instead of thermal pressure pushing outward and gravity um, pull, um, pushing inward the, the we now have radiation pressure added on top of that and a tremendous amount of radiation pressure which is definitely enough to keep gravity from from pulling this thing down to a smaller region, uh, even uh, even to the point that the interior of the star doesn't the density profile of the star doesn't change overly much at, uh, during the the main sequence portion. It is far more. It is in a greater sense of of hydrostatic equilibrium during this time. Now, if there isn't, again, mass is a, uh, mass is a, is a primary driver. Mass is going to dictate the strength of the gravitational pressure. 
if there's a not sufficient amount of mass, then the pressure is not going to be great enough to for, uh, to cause the temperature, cause the volume to get smaller, the pressure to get high enough, more importantly, the temperature to get high enough in the core, where the core will actually begin to fuse hydrogen to helium. Ultimately, the core never reaches 10 million Kelvin. It still burns hydrogen into, or converts hydrogen into deuterium, but really there is no hydrogen fusion going on. Um, I know the slide says these are failed stars. I don't like that uh, nomenclature because this is not a competition, as it were. You can't pass or fail the, uh, the formation of a star. These are just objects that instead of forming stars, they form into brown dwarfs. And very much like uh, the stars, they have their own spectral classification. From L dwarfs, which are the more massive, hotter uh, dwarfs, down to Y dwarfs. And here we have a... Um, so there are certain lines, uh, certain demarcations, when it comes to stars, brown dwarfs, and planets. Now, a colleague of mine, when I was in grad school, his thesis was to look for that, to, to finally, or precisely define that line between brown dwarfs and, and stars. And that's around 8% uh, of the mass of the sun. If it has 8% or greater, then it's going to turn into a star. If it has less than 8% the mass of the sun, it's going to turn into a brown dwarf. Now, the, the very important open question um, from that is what is the demarcation between brown dwarfs and planets, specifically gas giants? Um, uh, uh, it, is, it, is, it is something that fascinates me. Like, what is, um, what is, the, what is that line? Because I feel that brown dwarfs, uh, another, uh, another way of looking at these objects, instead of calling them failed stars, some, of the, some astronomers refer to them as super Jupiters. Uh, these are Jupiter stars planets. I would argue, and this is a digression, I know, but I would argue that uh, brown dwarfs form from a collapsing cl uh, cloud core. They form their own accretion disk, and that's how they are created. Planets form within the accretion disk, so I think it is a, there's a different formation mechanism, and if it's a different formation mechanism, then it should be called different things. So. That's my own personal uh, spin on this, um, but that's the idea of, of brown dwarfs. When we go back to the HR diagram, we can look at these, we can look at these uh, molecular clouds, we can look at the, these forming stars, and we can track uh, through their luminosities and their temperatures how they move on to the main sequence. What, is the, what phases do they go through uh, as it goes from a protostar down onto burning hydrogen to helium on its core? And they take certain tracks uh, depending, on, uh, depending on that track. And they start off um, on the side. Basically, the, you can notice there is a, you can essentially see almost a vertical line going down the right-hand side of the HR diagram. That is known as the Hayashi line. No star, no, you know, the protostars form to the left of that line. Uh, temperatures are higher than that line. The lines themselves are referred to as Hayashi tracks. Now, the process of evolution, which I won't get into the, really the specifics of, of of stellar collapse and then stellar contraction and yada yada, that varies again by mass. Certain stages, if the mass is high enough, certain stages do not happen um, in this process of evolution from protostar to, to main sequence star. But for the Sun, this is how the temperature and luminosity change as it forms. It drops uh, fairly linearly. Uh, it Temperature stays fairly constant and the luminosity drops uh, precipitously. It gets to a point where uh, hydrogen begins to fuse and then it pops up a little bit. And then, and then once the core really gets going, uh, the core itself pretty much is a fusion engine. It is a 
main sequence stuff. It sticks on the on the main sequence for a very long time. During the process of of formation, when we still have a protostar surrounded by uh, a I'm going to call it an accretion disk because that's the science. When I think about it, I'm more, I'm more interested in how the mass gets dumped onto the star um, and how it helps the protostar evolve. And anyway, has it has a pro, um, anyway, I call it an accretion disk. So, as this accretion disk is dumping material onto the protostar, it is making the protostar more massive and it is the gravitational pressure is increasing which again causes it sort of it facilitates the protostar's formation into a star the gas another thing is most everything in the universe has a magnetic field this magnetic field in most of the universe is fairly tenuous uh, the field strength is very very weak but if you collapse the gas down, that magnetic field gets frozen into that gas, gets brought on, brought along um, with the collapsing dust and gas, and it causes the magnetic field around that protostar to be very significant, very powerful. And so as the uh, material gets um, go or spirals in around the disk and gets dumped on the star. Depending on where it is, as it, in the disk where it gets dumped, it's either it's either going to make it onto the star and get accreted onto it, causing the mass of the star to get larger, or it's going to get flung out into jets, which are collimated beams, uh, magnetically collimated beams. And we can see this in nature with, again, um, that's prob most probably a Hubble image, where you can see the dark... Uh, extinct, extincted region of the disk itself when seen edge on and these very energetic bipolar jets moving uh, away from each other. Now depending on the mass of these stars uh, the jets become more uh, the power of the jet is again related to its mass so if you have a very massive object collapsing down the the powerful jets can actually be extremely long or extremely uh, far away and they can slam into the interstellar medium beyond their local environments and again that create shock waves which again releases even more energy and we refer to these as um, herbig harrow objects and this is a process which allow which sort of mitigates this the size of the star it doesn't allow a, a lot or a it sort it the more the more mass the larger the accretion disk the more of the mass gets shot out and so um, it helps to mitigate the total mass at the high end of, of the star <coughs> there are other physical there is another physical reason why uh, the star get gets there is a upper limit to the, the mass of the star it literally blows itself apart if the mass gets uh, any longer or any more than, say, about 150 solar masses or so. Um, when these star, when these things collapse, the the there is a certain terminology that they go through, and once they get down to the protostellar region, we refer to these as, um, if they're low mass, we refer to them as T Tauri stars. If they're high mass, we refer to them as Herbig, Herbig stars, A and E um, uh, mass. And depending on the evolution of the protostar, where it's basically a protostar with a forming disk in a chaotic environment, down to a established disk with a protostar in the center, down to a disk where it's mostly been, most of the dust and gas has been either collapsed into the star, formed into planets, or just ejected from the system. Um, those are different types of like class 0, class 1, class 2, class 3, um, uh, YSOs, young stellar objects, or more generally classical t starry stars when it's really big or when this disk is very prominent, and then uh, weak line t starry stars when the disk is uh, not so prominent.
star clusters. Now, where is, uh, does our knowledge of, of stellar evolution come from? Because the time scales involved, the quickest time scales involved are during uh, basically when the star forms and when the star dies. Star forms, uh, you have an, a G-type star, for example, is going to spend about 15 million years in its, um, in its protostellar phase. What I'm getting at is that there is no way, no matter how many grad students you have, there is no way to look at a single star and see how it evolves over time. We just don't have, obviously, we just don't live that long. So the way that we do this is we do this from looking at star clusters and the star, we make the assumption that the star cluster formed, the stars in the star cluster all formed roughly at the same time. Roughly around, because the evolution is, of protostellar phases are, are pretty, um, pretty short. And these become laboratories for looking at stellar, uh, stellar evolution almost exclusively beyond the protostellar phase. We're talking about zero age main sequence stars or stars that just form the main sequence and because of the, this assumption that we make that the star roughly formed at the same time um, we can see how if we if we look at the star or look at the cluster then depending on how long that cluster has been around that's gonna certain stars are going to have evolved quickly because of their mass is higher and formed into other evolved states and then we can test our theories of evolution um, to that. There are two types of star clusters uh, that we, we have... Oh, let me just go with the two classic types of star clusters. You have the Pleiades is what you're seeing on the slide and the previous slide. This is what we refer to as an open cluster. Open clusters have memberships of hundreds to maybe thousands of stars they are not gravitationally bound to each other, meaning that the stars are, have proper motions, they have motions in random directions, and they are just slowly dissipating with respect to one another. The Pleiades is so blue because, again, these stars are young, or these clusters are, this particular cluster is very young, and so the O stars, the B stars, the most prominent luminous stars, haven't had enough time to evolve off the main sequence. Then you have globular clusters. Globular clusters, as may be inferred, look like globs of, of stars. They are more spherically distributed. Um, they have uh, on the order of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of stars to them. And they allow us to look at the stellar evolutionary range uh, that is much further on. So we, for open clusters, we really can only see the evolution of high, very high mass stars. It's the it's the globular clusters, the gravitationally bound clusters, that we can see evolution across the entire, or nearly the entire, main sequence. And with that, let's get into a little bit of, a uh, little bit of math, and we can, we can know what the the glow, the dust glow, essentially of the of the gas, uh, based on again the the black body curve. We talked about the black body curve last time. There is a peak uh, of that curve and there is something called the Wien's Law which very simply is the, that peak wavelength equal to a constant divided by the temperature. If we can if we can measure the, the if we can measure the um, we can me if we can measure the spectral or the black body curve and get a peak of it we can then basically um, and we can and we know what the wavelength is at that we know what the peak wave we can measure the peak wavelength we can work backwards and we can then determine the temperature of the gas that that allows for that peak wavelength to exist so for example if the peak of the wavelength is 29 microns, then we can use this simple equation to determine that the temperature of the gas is 100 Kelvin. If the peak wavelength is much longer, like 290 uh, microns, then the temperature goes down, down around 10 Kelvin. 
This is the Stefan Boltzmann law, where you have L, the luminosity of the star is equal to 4 pi uh, times the Stefan Boltzmann constant, times the temperature, uh, or times the radius of the star squared, uh, times the uh, pro or temperature of the protostar to the fourth. And from this, we can derive uh, basically uh, the. In this case, we can we can derive the uh, the radius, or in this case, actually the the ratio of the two uh, of the two. Yes, ratio of the two uh, luminosities. Uh, in this case, we can is 10.6 if we assume certain radii, but typically we work backwards. Again, we find the distance to the cloud. We make the assumption that the cloud is um, the stars that are forming in this uh, region are relatively close to each other in relation to the distance to them. And we can determine the, we measure the apparent brightness, we get the luminosity, from the spectra, we can get temperature, we can work backwards, and then we can uh, rewrite this equation to get the, the radii uh, of these stars. And we, and because of that, we can approximate that solar-type stars, uh, solar-type protostars, or protostars that, move, uh, that eventually evolve into um, low-mass main sequence stars, typically have radii about three times that of, of the sun. And I think I am going to end there because I've already talked about the fact that uh, these this interstellar uh, formation or this stellar formation. Uh, well, let me say this: I've talked about the fact that you need dust in order to form the key elements or the molecular chains that ultimately form into organic material. But on top of that, and uh, again, I, I will. Uh, talk about this more or emphasize this more when we start talking about planets going around other stars, what we have found through observations of, of what we have found through observations of Kepler, Tess, and other um, planets, uh, other uh, planets, exoplanet search uh, missions is what is confirming what our models are saying about stellar formation. Because again, with the model of, of stellar formation, we have that protostar, and then you have this disk of material forming around it. That disk is not homogeneous, as pretty much nothing is, and from there you have gravitational collapse. That causes planets to form, and we would expect that to happen in every case. If you have a star forming, then that disk is going to form, and from that disk you're going to have planets forming. This is ubiquitous. And, and that is what our uh, observations are bearing out. Um, we're finding that every star uh, that we, uh, every, again, from a statistical analysis, we can infer that every star has planetary formation from it. All right. With that, I will end. Um, and um, I will post the next lecture either later today or more probably tomorrow. So until then, peace out, and I hope you found this enjoyable, if not educational.